Don't you love Pastor Jeff? And what a, what a great sermon this morning he did. Wasn't that amazing? That was a great sermon. Woo! I loved it every minute of it. You know, so tonight it picks up in that same chapter and he just kind of brings, brings it full circle. And, and I just want to say that uh, Romans 6, basically the first verses of it, says what he's going to say here. Uh, that, you know, what is faith? And basically he goes, uh, because grace abounds, do we go on sinning? God forbid. You miss the point of grace and you miss the point of faith when you go on sinning and don't understand that grace and faith is to cause you to live holy. It's not undoing the law, we'll see in the last verse of Romans 3, but it's fulfilling the law. And there is no way that any of you in your own will, pulling up your bootstraps, making the determination with every fiber within you that you're going to be good enough and live good enough. And that's what Pastor Jeff was saying to us, that within us, we are born with a sin nature and you can't change your heart. Only God changes your heart. And what is the power that changes your heart? It's grace. That's what grace does. Grace is not some sort of soap that scrubs your sins away. Grace is something that happens inside of you where God changes your desire and gives you a new power to live it out. We are born again, Roman uh, John 3. When Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, he said, you must be born again. Nicodemus said, I don't understand. How can I go back in my mother and be born again? And not talking about flesh born again. He said, born again by the Spirit. The same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead comes into your life to make your heart different, to make you new, to give you a new desire, and give you the same resurrection power that you can live in victory in Revelation, the John the Revelator said, he that overcomes, I will grant to him into life. And I want to tell you, God, by his spirit, will make you new because you can never please God without God in you doing it. In fact, even faith is a gift. The measure of faith to believe God, God puts the faith. The Bible makes that clear. You can't even muster the faith, nor can you decide a time when you're going to be a Christian or you're going to be saved. Like Pastor Jeff mentioned, unless the Spirit draws you, a man can't come to Christ. And so you're, you're worthless. Your ability to ever change or, quote, be a Christian is zero. You can't do it on your own. That's when you realize I'm undone I can't do it I get on my knees and I say God forgive me come and save me and by his power of his grace he enters you to make you born again by his spirit and changes that heart that always goes after sin a heart of stone into a heart of flesh that gives you desire to follow Jesus Christ and not only a desire but how wrong would it be to give you a desire to follow God and then leave you powerless the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the spirit that saves us, that enters us, that empowers us, that quickens the word. And if we will take the sword of the spirit, which, the, which Paul, Paul writes in Ephesians, which is the word of God, and take that sword as the sword of the Holy Spirit, who quickens it and makes it come alive, it becomes life-giving to us that we can be overcomers in Jesus' name. How many say amen? amen. So I want to show you tonight Two things, two points. One, it's, it's the title of the message, though I didn't know how to do this. We were short-staffed in the office, and I didn't have anybody to help me with the PowerPoint, and so you're just going to have to take notes and use your Bible or your phone. Romans 3, 21 to 31, you can open it up there. And the points are simple. Righteousness by faith is the title, and the points are righteousness, the works of righteousness, and the position of righteousness, the position of righteousness and the works of righteousness. You can't have one without the other. The position doesn't exist unless the works are there. And the works mean nothing unless the position is there. And you may not understand what I'm saying yet, but in a minute, I'll get into that. Now, Jesus had a brother. His name was James. He wrote a book. And he addressed this whole idea of faith without works. And I'm going to start there, but we're going to come back to, if you'll just be ready, to Romans 3.21. And Jesus, James rather, says in chapter 2 of his book, starting at verse 14, he said, What use is it, my brother, if someone says that he has faith but has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing in need of daily food, 
And one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm, be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body. What use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead being by itself. But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, James says, that I will show you my faith by my works. Verse 19, you believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. This is a very important verse here, verse 19, because he is saying that the faith without works is simply belief. He's clarifying because the word faith in the Greek means trust and obey. Did you know that? And did you know that you can't make yourself trust and obey? The grace of God comes to you, you call on him, and he puts faith in your heart, and it grows in you. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Who makes the word of God alive? Who is the living word? Jesus Christ. In John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. In John 1, 14, and the word of God became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, even as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That word of God is that which changes our hearts and is quickened by the Spirit of God and it makes a difference to us. And you see, faith arises from the Word. You see that? The Spirit of God puts it in us. But when he's talking about faith is dead without works, he's not talking about saving faith. See, we're saved by faith, but faith that saves is that we're saved by faith alone. But safe that faith that saves is never alone. We're saved by faith alone. But faith that saves is never alone. That's what James says. And I'll show you Jesus, his brother, the Son of God, said the same thing. In other words, faith that is alone and doesn't produce fruit. Jesus said, you know them by their fruits. It doesn't produce anything. It's just talk. It's not really faith, because faith means, in the Greek, to trust and obey. It is belief. And James says, if the demons, they, they, look what he says, verse 19. He says, you believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. In other words, belief, faith that's just belief is, is nothing. It doesn't change you. Are you with me? All right. Now, we're talking about the position of righteousness, all right? We're talking about, and you'll hear it in a minute. It'll, it'll, it'll come clear. Verse 20, but are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Why? Because faith that saves, faith, faith alone saves, but faith that saves is never alone. You hear that? We're saved by faith alone, but faith that saves is never alone. You know who said that, Brother Tossin? One of the greatest preachers ever, but I can't think of his name. <laughs> who was it? Spurgeon. Thank you. That's who it was. Spurgeon. He, Brother Tossin has got a mem better memory than I, than I do, and he's like 130 years old. I don't even know how he does it. <laughs> uh, Verse 22, you see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. Let's see, where was I? Abraham. All right, verse 24, you see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. In other words, it's not faith that saves. It's dead. It's belief. Now, the word, the word faith, as I said, you look it up in the Greek, you go look, it means to trust and obey, right? Now, the position of righteousness that Pastor Jeff talked about is by faith when God comes in by his grace and changes your heart and puts a measure of faith that we walk with God and you're serious. And when I talk about 
works and that by your fruits you'll know them. We're talking about spirit fruit, right? Holy Spirit fruit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, temperance, temperatures of self-control, goodness, faith, faithfulness, all of that, right? Kindness. And, you know, in other words, when, when, if Jesus is in you, people will see your tree, you're a tree, and see the fruit of God hanging from your limbs. They'll see it. Some people, it's hard to see any fruit in them. Now, the thing about it is, is, is as a person is processing, becoming more like Jesus is a word that sanctification or to be sanctified or become holy, the process of becoming like Jesus is a process. And every one of us have journeyed. And uh, in that journey, as you have faith and you're trusting and obeying, you have Turn from yourself and the self-life of, of greed, of pride, of lust. And you've turned to Jesus, turned away from my will to thy kingdom come, thy will be done. In the journey, as you're walking toward Jesus, you see good fruit. You see the works of faith. But... There's also the battle of the flesh, and you're not always perfect as you walk. And you get over here, and then the Holy Spirit convicts you, and you say, God, forgive me. You say to other people that you might offend because of your flesh, you say, would you forgive me? And you work this out. It's what Paul talks about when he writes to the church, at, I believe it's Philippi, working out your salvation with fear and trembling. It might be actually Ephesians. Working out your salvation with fear. He's not saying working for your salvation. He's saying the process of following Jesus to stay on that path. Because eternal security is a real deal if you keep your eyes on Jesus and you look to the grace of God and you keep your faith in Jesus, you're going to make it. It doesn't mean that you're some sort of level of perfection right? Or that, okay, you struggled too much. You, you, just, you just messed up too much. You're not going to get in. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is that when you are saved by grace through faith, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, by grace are you saved through faith unto good works. When that happens, God comes in and changes you, and that faith, which means to trust and obey, begins to show. And even though you're not perfect, in position, you're in righteousness. Righteous means, righteousness is right standing with God. And by faith, you're in right standing with God. In other words, when you repented, because grace doesn't activate without repentance. It's not something you join a church denomination or a church group or a local church, and somehow, all of a sudden, this grace that's amazing that we've read about comes to you, and no matter what you do, the blood of Jesus just covers it and you're a Christian forever. No, you have to see what Pastor Jeff said this morning. Every person is sin, born in a sin nature, all a sin. And we got to cry out to God, save me. Change my heart. Change me. Come in by your spirit and make me brand new. Give me a new desire and give me the power to live out a different life that reflects Jesus Christ because I can't just make up my mind to do it. A lot of people are stuck in religion and they come to the conclusion that this is the best I can do because they're doing it with their own strength. But that's not the best we can do. We can be a holy people. God says, be holy for I am holy. We can, but we need the word and we need it quickened by the spirit. And the problem is, is too many people have joined the Christian club and they've said they're saved. They say their sins are forgiven, but they're not full of any kind of spirit. They don't fill themselves with the word. They're powerless and they might make it in by the skin of the teeth because I'm not a judge. I'm not saying they weren't saved. But I will tell you that unless you repent, which means turn from your sin and turn toward God, re godly sorrow leads to repentance and you cry out to God, save me, because you see that you're desperate and you're undone and you, you give up trying to change and the only thing that can change you, the only thing that can move you is God. And when you cry out to God, he comes running to you to change your heart. And when he does, even though you might still have a lot of flesh because you're a brand new Christian, in position, your righteousness is there. 
The position of righteousness is as God looks at you, he sees the blood of Christ that is flowing over you, and you're right before God because you've accepted that wonderful gift of eternal life that was provided in forgiveness of sin by the blood of Jesus that washes away our sin, and he sees you that way. But when you're a baby Christian, you might have a lot of little things hanging off of your tree that needs to be clipped. My language, my alcohol problem, my what I look at problem, my jealousy problem, my out of control anger problem, my unforgiveness problem. Clip, clip, clip. And he clips those things off and grows new fruit that looks more like Christ, and he does it by the Spirit and by the Word. Are you with me? Right, the position of righteousness. I'm going to show you one more passage, okay? And I'm not going to go much longer, but I'm going to get to Romans before I'm done because it, it just really pops when I'm done with these other verses. In Romans chapter 10, in case some of you think I'm crazy, Paul is dealing, the Hebrews is the Jews. He's dealing with them. And uh, he's dealing with them because what Paul mentions to the Romans, he says, grace is so great. They go, oh, let's just sin so the grace may abound. No, he's dealing. He said, you can't, that's not, that's, you don't even, your heart's not even right when you think that way. Anybody that thinks that way, how, how it's like, oh, okay, you're going to give me all of this. I'll just take it and go on and do my way. Like there's no relationship in that. I mean, you, you don't just mistreat someone that gives his life for you and says, you know, here, I give you all of this. And you go, yay, uh, uh, I'm going to keep on sinning so your grace will be even greater. You know, it's like, ha, 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 I'll, let my, I'll just live for my flesh all day long and I'll still go to heaven. Well, Romans says, God forbid, that's not, that's not grace at all. You can't do that, Romans chapter 6. Hebrews 10 says it this way. And notice, I love the NASB that I'm reading. In verse 26 of Hebrews 10, it says, For if we go on sinning willfully, notice that, willfully, go on sinning. In other words, I make a determination, it's okay, to live a lifestyle of sin. And I, I justify it, I excuse it, make excuses, I say I can't help it, and we go on and we live in sin that's clear sin and call it okay. It's okay because God's grace is good enough. Notice it says, for if we go on, keep, it, keep going on, sinning willfully. In other words, I choose to live in sin. That's what it's saying. After receiving the knowledge of the truth, there is no longer, there no longer remains a sacrifice of sins. And what it's talking about there is not like forever. It's talking about while you're going on and you continue to sin. While you're sinning, Hebrews 10, 26. If you continue there, going, I'm just going to live in sin, and I just go on and go on, when you're in that, that sacrifice, that washing of the blood, it's not there anymore. You're, it's gone. That's what it's saying. The worst thing it could be saying that some people read it is that you can't even get back. You're done. You're doomed to hell forever. That's not what it's saying. Because throughout Scripture, that's not substantiated throughout Scripture. It does not say that. There's always an opportunity with breath for God's mercy and his grace to forgive you and bring you back. It's not saying that. But as long as you say, it's okay, I'll just live this way. So if you're living out of wedlock, you're living a life uh, of, uh, uh, instead of a traditional marriage with a man and a woman between two men and two women, that's, you're living that way. You're just going, you're just, you're just ignoring God's word and Right then, you're out, outside that blood. You're, you stepped outside of his grace that's covering you. There no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Verse 27, what does remain? A terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of fire which will consume the adversaries. Anyone, verse 28, who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. He's telling the, the Jews this, the Old Testament, that know the Old Testament. That's how they did it back then. How much severe punishment do you think that he will deserve who has trampled under the foot the Son of God? And, and look at that. Literally, by going on sin and saying it's okay, willfully sinning and saying, I'm okay, I'm a Christian, you're trampling underfoot the Son of God and regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant. 
The, one version says you're trampling on the blood of Jesus, stepping all over it, insulting it, by which he was sanctified. And here it is, and it's insulted the spirit of grace. And if you don't think that grace is given by the spirit, there it is. The spirit of grace, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of grace. The Holy Spirit is what makes grace activates in you because the Holy Spirit enters you. You're born again by the spirit and it changes your heart to give you a new desire. You can't quit wanting to sin and be selfish and proud and greedy. You can be trained to be religious and control it and hide it, but you can't really change your inside. Only Jesus can. Jesus saves. And that's why it's so important we get a grip that we're all sinners, like Pastor Jeff said, so that you fall on our face and say, Jesus saved me. And if you're watching online and you never had that experience, you grew up in church and you just believe the theory, the, the, the formulas of salvation, you may not be born again until you see yourself as needing a Savior. You need to cry out to Jesus, say, save me. And he goes on. But I, I just, I just, oh, well, let's just read it. It says it, it uh, insults the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a terrifying thing to fall in the hands of the living God. So don't play this game of I'm saved, I'm going to heaven. It doesn't really matter what I do because Jesus died on the cross and his blood covers my sin. No way. If you're even playing the game, you didn't get saved because your brain's not thinking right. That's not a saved thinking. A safe thinking is, I'm thankful to Jesus who saved me. And because I'm thankful, I want to live close to God. Because I'm thankful, I want to live my life for God. Because God has changed my heart. Everything I do, I want to do right before God. Now, that doesn't mean, if you don't look at me like that. Quit looking at me that way. I'm not, I'm not perfect in holiness. I've made mistakes. You're looking at me like, well, I know what you've done. Yes, you know what I've done. And I know what you've done. We all have done it. But there's a big difference of falling short and just going, it's okay, I don't even concerned about it. Why do you think Paul in his letters over and over says, put off, put on, put off the old man, put on the new man, flee from youthful lust, seek after God, okay? So now we go to Jesus' word in the kingdom, in the Ma in Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, 7, his Sermon on the Mount. Seek, Matthew 6, 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. There is the works. And he goes on from that verse. When he says seeking his righteousness, he's going acts of righteousness. He's going how Rahab did, what Abraham did, offering his son Isaac. He's, and he goes on and he tells you, remember, he talks about acts of righteousness. He says, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. When you give alms to the poor, don't be like the hypocrites. He says, if someone asks you for your shirt, give them your coat, coat too. If they, if they smite you on the one side of the cheek, turn the other cheek, right? He says, if somebody needs cold water, needs a cup of water, give them a cup of water. If somebody needs food, give them food. He says, in other words, show your faith by what you do. He sounds just like his brother James, who backs up that words are cheap. The demons believe belief isn't faith. The word faith, again, is to trust and obey. And the word believe, he who believes on the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. That word believe is the verb form of faith. It means the same thing as faith. It means that you've trusted and obeyed. You've turned to Jesus and you're following him. When we say in obedience, it doesn't mean perfect obedience. Jesus said this. He said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. That word keep in the Greek, I've told you this many times. If you love me, Jesus said, you'll keep my commandments. The word keep is a sailor word. It's they, the sailors would keep the stars. In other words, they set the course of their ship by watching the stars, and they know the direction where they're going, and they can get there by, quote, keeping the stars. They're following. Jesus says, keep my commandments. In other words, set your course for your life by my commandments. Keep your eye on the commandments. Did it not what the Old Testament says? Meditate upon them day and night on my law, right? They'll be like a tree, Psalm 1, planted by the water. He says, teach to your children diligently to follow my commandments. Teach them to them. Line up on line, precept upon precept. In other words, the word of God to follow after God, to keep what God says and being serious about following and obeying Jesus. Are you with me? Right? And so in doing that, that becomes the, the, uh, not the position of righteousness, but the works of righteousness. It becomes proof 
of your righteousness. Where right standing with God is the position through the blood of Christ as God looks at you as a child of God. And he can tell if your heart is right. That's why you, you can't judge that. You may judge someone that they're not really saved because they haven't been sanctified. They haven't been processed and they've still got a lot of carnality. But really their heart is pure and God has already started to work. They're in process. And others may have learned a church discipline, a behavior, and it looks good on the outside because they don't do the big stuff. You know, they're, they're not, you know, they're married and they stay married and they, you know, they're not getting drunk and they're not, you know, running around or not, you know, cursing and carrying on and stealing and cheating and all that. They, they got all the big stuff down. That doesn't mean your heart has been transformed. Right? Because only the Spirit can do that and only God knows. I don't know about you and you don't know about me. Be worried about the beam in your own eye before you check out the speck in mine and vice versa. And as pastors, it's the biggest trick in the world for us to like look and go, I don't think they ever were saved. I can't believe they're acting that way. You know, are you kidding me? You know, and sometimes I look at myself in the mirror and go, are you really saved, Weaver? So when my flesh rises up, you know, now, I'm not even going to ask you if you've ever seen my flesh rise up. I don't even want to know the answer. Quit smiling, Pastor Jeff. I'm coming after you. All right, this is the conclusion. You ready? Turn to Romans chapter 3, 21. Here we are. Pastor Jeff preached the first part of it. And the title in my NASB of this passage is Justification by Faith. Righteousness by Faith. Okay. It starts off, but now apart from the law, and this is the NASB, the, I think the NIV might be on the screen. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith, which is trusting, obeying, in Jesus Christ, for all those who believe, the word believe isn't the belief like the demons believe and tremble. It's the, the noun it's the verb, rather, of faith. It's verb, believe, which is to follow after, keep, the, keep Jesus' commandments. It's to trust and obey. Jesus Christ, for all those who believe, for there's no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So the only way to get there is to believe, to put your faith in Jesus, to trust and obey, being justified as a gift by his grace. You can't change your heart. The gift of his grace is the power of God that enters you by his spirit to make you born again. You can't make yourself born again. You can't change your behavior and then you're a Christian. You can't change your behavior and now you're born again. Only the spirit of God can make you born again by the spirit of grace. So we all have to do it. There's no distinction. Everyone, all has sinned. All fall short of God's standards, his glorious, glory standards, the glory of God. Being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a perpetuation, in other words, the substitution or the provision for us in his blood through faith. Not belief, not belief the demon says, faith that trusts and obeys because we're broken, we're to our end, we cry out and God comes into our life and takes over. You see, you can't make God come into you. You hear me? You can't. You cry out to God. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time. So that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So because of what God did in you, he makes you just. He sanctifies you. He makes you righteous in position. This is what he's talking about. And he justifies you because he is the justifier when you have what? Faith in Jesus. Faith to trust and obey. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. Why would you boast when you can't change your heart? Why would you boast if you can't make yourself born again? Who did it? Jesus. That's why we're, I love the first verse of that song. Thank you, Jesus, Pastor Brett, that y'all did. It, it goes right with this, the first verse. You should sing that to start off here in a minute. 
But what kind of law, it says? Of works? No, but by a law of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law, which is true. That's exactly right, because faith is trust and obeying. It's true. James just points out that that faith will always have works. That's all James is pointing out. Or is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not God of the Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since indeed God, who will justify the circumcised, that's what the Jews did, they circumcised. And the Jews thought, well, the Gentiles, if they're going to be right with God, they got to get circumcised. And Paul's saying, no way, you don't. He says, yes, of the, of the Gentiles also, since indeed God will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith is one, both of them. And here's the verse where Paul at the end basically says everything I've said so far from Hebrews, from James chapter 2, here's where he says it. Look, watch it, verse 31. Do we then nullify the law through faith? In other words, does it matter what you do because now you have faith, you're going to go to heaven, grace is abounding? Do we nullify it? what God says is right and wrong? Do we nullify the Ten Commandments? Do they not matter anymore because Jesus has saved you and washed you with his blood? I mean, if you think that's the case, read Hebrews again, chapter 10, starting in verse 26. Now look what it says, may it never be. And watch this. On the contrary, Pastor Jeff said this to me, we establish the law. In other words, we establish it by how we live because faith establishes the law. Because it doesn't nullify that we don't need to live it. No, it empowers us to trust and obey. When you put your faith in Jesus and cry out to him and his spirit makes you born again, he does a miraculous work in you that you can't do. And that's the work of grace. That's why grace is so amazing and we're all lost until there's the moment, a power moment of his spirit that saves us. Grace, grace, Pastor Brett. God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse my sin. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all my sin. It's all true. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch. Pastor, Pastor Jeff preached me under the pew, and I felt like a wretch because I know we all are wretches. We are all undone. We are all have a sin nature we're born with, but that's the past today. But Jesus, Pastor Jeff said, but Jesus. We're all sinners, but Jesus. Romans 6, 23. The wages, what we earn of sin is death. Death in the Bible is, is spiritual death there. Eternal separation from God. That's spiritual death. Eternally separated from God. But, but Jesus. The gift, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That was the Jesus note he played on the piano. The gift of God is eternal life through who? Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen? Amen. Can we sing that first verse of what's that song I just said? That, Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Watch these words. Put that up there if you can find them, John, back in our set that we sang. Take grace that flows like a river washing over me. Fount of heaven, love of Christ overflowing me. That's a picture of what happens when Jesus saves you. Will you stand with me? I want to say what we're going to do. I, I want to tell you this. If I've confused you, talk to me. Don't just walk away. Because someone said, I believe it was Spurgeon. I think Adrian Rogers quoted him as well. Until you preach grace where it's misunderstood that it's easy grace, grace hasn't been preached right. But until you preach works, until it's misunderstood, you haven't preached that right. Because God demands holiness, doesn't he? And you see, to balance this out, you have to experience the salvation that you get it in the spirit realm so you understand that you're saved by grace and nothing you can do can save yourself. But that salvation has changed you where that your life is full of fruit and bears good fruit and the works of righteousness. The works of righteousness are on the tree. The fruit that Jesus said, you'll know them by their fruits, right? Are you with me? But we can't, we can't discipline ourselves and put that fruit on ourselves. It's the Spirit fruit, the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is this. It's God's Spirit in us. You get it? No. 
if we, if we spend more time with the flesh, we'll get more fruit of flesh. If we spend time in the Word and the presence of God, then it'll bear some spiritual fruit stuff. Now, so what we're going to do is I'm going to let you either go or sit because we're going to sing some older songs and I want you to soak the Spirit of God and the Spirit of His grace into you. Pastor Brett's going to lead us, okay? And I don't know if we'll have all the words or not, but this one on the screen, Pastor Brett may have put them in there. No. Well, he figured this one out. He's got it up there. So I worship you, Almighty God. So you can be seated. You can stand. You can do And you can go when you're dismissed. But I want to pray for those online. I want to pray, Jesus, if anyone needs to ask for your spirit of grace to change them, they go, why do I always desire evil and my feet run to evil? Why is my heart so full of lust and greed and pride? And so I'm so selfish. I pray, God, you're the only one that can save them, save me, save us. Save us by your grace. The power of your grace to change our hearts, like Pastor Jeff preached this morning that we might be the children of God and grow to be sanctified, grow to be more like you, Jesus, to begin the process through your word, anointed by your spirit, the sword of the spirit, the word of God, quickening in us to change us from glory to glory, deeper into light, becoming what you called us to be. Grow in us, Jesus, we pray. We thank you that our position through the blood of Jesus is the position of righteousness. We're right standing with you because you come and changed our heart and saved us. And your blood has cleansed us. But we couldn't do that. But I also thank you that you're working by your spirit and your word. The works of righteousness that Jesus talked about in the Sermon on the Mount. And that James talked about. The Hebrew writer talked about. I pray God help us. In Jesus name. Amen.